we tend to see law in terms of structures of power. We tend to see what law does and how it operates as a regulatory apparatus. But what if I were to tell you that really skilled lawyers see law in a different way? That rather than seeing what law is, we see what law isn't. Instead of looking at the way in which law operates, most of the time, we look at the gaps in between the law, the areas where it's uncertain. And this is what we're talking about when we talk about the phantom zone in law. What it is that lawyers do is look for the areas of law where there are those areas of uncertainty, and that's where change takes place, and that's where law, law work takes place. You've probably seen this image before. Um, it's an example of negative space and the fact that, depending on your point of view, you either see the goblet or you see the two faces. And all it requires is a change of perspective. Here's another one. Is it a rabbit? Is it a duck? Depends on how you're looking at it. Sure, you've seen these pictures before. You can do a similar thing when you look at law. When we are first introduced to law, we, and particularly through the IRAC method, we see law as a certain set of structures that are, that are definite, that are well established and apply power in particular ways. But if we change our perspective and we're no longer looking at the net, so to speak, and we start looking at the holes in the net, that's where we actually start seeing where good lawyering work takes place. And this is where you need lawyers. If the law is certain, a robot can tell you what you need to know. And in fact, we're moving very quickly to a future where robots will be telling people what they need to know about the law. And where the human being lawyer comes in is where there's that exercise of judgment, of creative thinking and interpretation in looking at those gaps. Now, the tools we already use around precedent analysis already take advantage of this, and they already contemplate these gaps. So when we distinguish a case, we're looking at the limits of that case that as, as a direct set of authorities. And creative lawyering allows us to look at situations where that case doesn't necessarily apply. We distinguish the case on its facts and we say that that's only really certain if exactly the same or very, very similar circumstances come up again. Current circumstance, of course, is quite different and there's an error of ambiguity there. It also happens in the definition of ratio and obita and the way we balance the balance between those two things. And you can make a very, very good case for very, very narrowly confined ratio in a case that, again, it's part of a distinguishing a case that's confined very closely to its facts. And much of the wider application, we can say, is just generally obita. It's generally, it's persuasive, but it's not a, not a binding authority on us in terms of applying that that authority, that precedent in other circumstances. We also have ambiguity built into the structure of cases where there are multiple judges, where we have multiple meanings and multiple interpretations. Just because the majority agree on an outcome does not mean that they agree on the way in which they reach that outcome or the law underneath it. So they can arrive at the same solution by different routes. And it is quite possible to end up in a situation where Judge A and Judge B are in the majority, but Judge B and Judge C, who's in the minority, are the ones who actually agree on the method by which they reach the result. They had a different interpretation at the end of the day, but they used the same method. You then end up in an interesting situation where the majority judges don't actually form a majority on what the law is. Actually, one of the majority judges and the minority judge actually forms the strongest opinion in that case. And that's the sort of reading that you've got to read fairly deeply into a case to understand. And just having a look at what a textbook says about it's not necessarily going to help. That situation becomes even worse when, say, you have seven judges in a case and suddenly you've got an all and multiple principles, you've got a whole lot of different complex maps going on in that particular case. And there is a classic confounding situation that occurs too when a judge agrees with another judge but then goes and restates different, slightly different reasons in the way in which they uh, reach that decision. And then as a, as a lawyer, we've got that very difficult, and particularly as a law student, that very difficult situation where you've got to closely read the two and say, when the judge says, I agree with Judge A, are they really agreeing with them? Or the, the very fact that they've set out a new set of reasoning, is that just a slightly different variation on the same point? Or are they making a different point when they do that? And that's something that's particularly confronting and annoying to deal with in many cases. So the tools we have in interpreting cases 
show us that what we do is we're picking out that uncertainty, we're pulling out the the, the parts of that uncertainty and we're forming it into, into a new argument. So where does this uncertainty come from? There's a few different places. One is that it can come from unclear drafting in the case of legislation or unclear expression in the case of case law, particularly as time has gone past. Um, we express ourselves in different ways, we use different words, and this can be the source of uncertainty. It can be the fact that the original words aren't particularly clear. But there are other ways we can get to uncertainty. There can be changes that occur over time, not just as the meanings change, but the situations change, and the way in which we apply the law becomes different. And suddenly a principle which has been you know, very strong for 100 years, we suddenly look at it and we say, well, it doesn't really apply that way anymore, and we can draw that uncertainty out then. We also find uncertainty with unforeseen interaction of two or more different rule sets. Got one set of law over here, another set of law over here, and no one's actually ever put them together to see what happens. And suddenly when you put them together, the things that looked all right by themselves suddenly operate in a strange way when you try and combine those rules together. We also have the development of new rules out of, out of the complex interrelationship between um, the, the patterns of precedent that occur in previous law. You can have principles that, that occur that develop and evolve over time. And when we start looking at them in, uh, with a long historical view, we can start seeing these patterns quite clearly. And in the software world, this might be called emergent behavior. But the system does produce its own, its own principles. And sometimes those principles become not necessarily a new source of uncertainty, but they become a new source of a new type of certainty where we can say, you know what, having seen how all these principles interrelate, I think there's this overall principle that's occurring from all these cases. The judges haven't have been at ground level, they haven't had the uh, ability to look above and see it developing the way we have, but we're seeing this new principle develop. So again, something which seemed to be you now trundling along in its own certain way, when you take a, a big view, a long view on it, suddenly we see there is new law emerging out of there in a way we hadn't seen before. And the last way I guess that we have uncertainty is where gaps are deliberately left. Where there's a situation where, and, and judges can often say this overtly, I'm not deciding on this particular matter because it's not relevant to this case. However, if the case appears before us again, we will have to make a decision about this. So sometimes these areas of uncertainty are left deliberately untested by judges who know that whatever they say is going to be over anyway, and they would rather consider that matter in full if they see that, if they, they see that case again. Right, so what does this uncertainty mean for legal research and for legal researchers? Um, first of all is that not all fact situations are the same. And again, this is where I'm not picking on IRAC or anything, but the IRAC approach where you pick one thing, you pick a case that looks like that thing and you apply it, doesn't really hold out in the real world. Because the skill in distinguishing cases and making persuasive arguments is saying, well, this looks certain, it looks like that principle applies here. However, I've got a really good argument as to why that doesn't occur. So being skilled in analysis and persuasive in the way you present your, your opinion can make a big difference in the way in which things are seen. And there have been plenty of cases throughout history where everyone has presumed the law has gone one way and no one's ever tested it till someone clever comes along and says, you know what? I don't think that's the way it goes at all. And the court says, well, yeah, actually, you've got a really good point there. The second point is that firm rules often have blurry edges and they're often designed that way so that they can evolve and change over time. And again, if we... We're, we're, if we're just looking at learning law for the first time, it's easy to see it as, here's the rule, here's the application. But as we get a more complicated view of law, we actually see that the rule often will have built into it some degree of flexibility so that we don't end up setting up ourselves for tyranny in the future, where we have no flexibility in the way in which we apply our laws. Um, Another thing for researchers is that new laws are often created from uncertainty and the cross-pollination of principles. Um, the law is becoming more and more complicated all the time, particularly with new fields of regulation opening up every day. And sometimes where we get new laws is with these two, is with disparate things coming together and different ideas from different jurisdictions perhaps, or diff diff entirely different areas of law suddenly apply. 
the area of fiduciary um, obligations that comes out of equity has been applied in all sorts of strange and wonderful ways in other areas of law where people have gone, you know what, maybe we could apply it. Hang on, that, that looks like a really interesting principle. We could apply that there. And again, it's about the people having the, the cleverness and the creativity to apply it, but it's also about that solid foundation of research that you get to, that you get that understanding of where those things come from. And a final point is that it's always worth double checking, even when, a, when the case notes you read or the textbook seem certain on a principle, because sometimes they get it wrong. Sometimes for the, they simplify because that's what they do. This is why you read a textbook, is to get the simple answer. But there are plenty of cases where the simple answer is not the answer that, that occurs when a case goes to trial or when, a, when a, a situation occurs and regulation fails and the law needs to be changed or reformed. So there's an overview of uncertainty. Um, you may have started out with the idea that uncertainty was a bad thing uh, and a source of anxiety because as lawyers we should know everything. But let me tell you that uncertainty is actually your friend because that is where the real work of a lawyer is. Thank you.